Without further ado, Mary Holland serves as President and General Counsel to the Children's Health Defense, CHD, a sound health advocacy organization. Before joining CHD staff, Holland taught in the faculty of the NYU School of Law for 17 years and lectured at Columbia Law School on international human rights. She has co-authored or co-edited three books, among them, Vaccine Epidemic, How Corporate Greed, Biased Science, and Coercive Government Threaten Our Human Rights, Our Health, and Our Children. She has spoken in Congress, state legislators, internationally on informed consent and vaccination. She appears weekly on CHD TV's podcast, This Week with Mary and Polly, for the week's news in review. And she is a native of Buffalo, New York. And she was there until age 13. And I'll let her tell you when she came to Chautauqua next time. Ladies and gentlemen, to talk about child health care, are we on track? Hello? Hello? Sounds much better now. The subject of our talk is Childhood Health, Are We on Track? Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Holland. Paul, thank you so much. It's really a privilege and an honor to be here. I was born in Buffalo, and I came to Chautauqua once as a teenager and was enchanted. So it's a really special opportunity to be back here. Can everybody hear me in the back? Great, okay. I wanna give special thanks to Paul Anthony and to Patricia Lemmer, without whom I'm sure I would not be here. So it's, um, I'm really grateful to them. So as Paul said, I wanna talk about childhood health. Are we on the right track? And I'm speaking as a parent. I'm sure many of you are parents. My background is in law. I'm an attorney, I'm an advocate, I'm a writer, I'm an educator. And as he said, I've been working for the last four years for a group called Children's Health Defense. So I'm sure you all are aware that a lot of children today do have chronic health conditions, allergies, asthma, ADD, ADHD, autism, anxiety, and those are just the A's. Um, and I just would like a show of hands, how many of you know a child who has obesity, diabetes, uh, depression? How many people know a child with one of these conditions? Any of them, obesity, anxiety, any of them, bipolar, so it's a lot of hands. And how many people know somebody who the child is no issues, no mental issues, no physical issues, absolutely nothing? So that's great. And it looks like kind of a show of hands on both sides, right? And I did a long walk this morning and was really happy to see all the kids biking to the children's program and walking, and, and that looked fantastic. But I think we're gonna look at some numbers. Children actually were, there were fewer chronic conditions among children decades ago. Not every school, I'm in my 60s, when I went to school, not every school had an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, a physical therapist, a psychologist, and a social worker. But literally, and they didn't have EpiPens, and they didn't have um, sort of uh, padded rooms. And all of those things are real. Those are really part of the childhood experience today. Uh, it's not the same. Um, it's easy to imagine, oh, I'm just nostalgic, and that it really was the same. It's not the same. Children really are sicker today. Um, and that's really what we want to talk about. So the founder of Children's Health Defense is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He's on leave at the moment. But in a recent um, speech, he said, we spend more in the United States on health care than any other country, and we have the worst health outcomes. That's of the developed world. There is a chronic disease epidemic in America. In the 40s, 50s, and 60s, we had a healthy population, at least much healthier. Now we have the sickest generation of children in the history of the United States. One in every 34 children has autism today. Missing autism is like missing a train wreck. There's study after study after study that shows that this epidemic is real. It's not the result of changing diagnostic criteria. It's an epidemic. So I wanna show that for sure, in the early part of the 1900s, we had a major problem in this country and globally with childhood mortality from infectious diseases, things like tuberculosis, things like scarlet fever, um, 
yellow fever, malaria, those were real conditions, typhoid, typhus. But with a lot of different factors, sanitation, refrigeration, antibiotics, the infectious disease mortality by the early 1960s was at a very low level and largely a stable level, right? So global mortality rate in 2020, and this is all people, not just children, but 4.3%. And non-infectious disease, chronic diseases are largely steady over this period. So we've seen a drastic decline in deaths from infectious disease. But at the same time, particularly in children, we have seen this dramatic escalation in chronic health conditions. And so some of these numbers are actually slightly out of date, but these are all government statistics. These are not made up numbers, and if you wanna to go to our website, Children's Health Defense, you can read the citations for all of these. So over half of American children have some kind of chronic health condition, be that depression, obesity, suicidality, developmental disorders, anxiety, ADHD, asthma, food allergies, autism, and even cancer. And we're even seeing more serious health conditions, which I'll come to, like stroke and heart attacks in very young children today. So I think we do have to ask, what is going on? Why is this happening? Is it the same? If it's different, why is it different? And it's not just physical health that's affecting our children today. We're also seeing that children in the United States are underperforming in a school context or educational context, children in other similarly situated countries. So this is showing, and this is, um, this is 15 year olds, and this is from 2022, but it's showing that the US is 24th in the world for reading, 36th in the world for math, 28th in the world for, for science. And we're behind countries like Poland, Vietnam, South Korea. And again, we have to ask what's going on. That wasn't always the case. The US previously had much higher rankings. And we started to see these declines certainly in the last few years. So there was widespread school closures. Clearly, that had a, a very detrimental effect on children's learning from 2020 to 2023. But this graph is telling us, and again, these are national numbers, it's telling us that this decline didn't start in 2020, that it actually, we see a decline since 2012, going down and then literally accelerating. So we're seeing these problems in children's health, physical health, and intellectual and mental health. We're very fortunate to have Patricia Lemmer here, who has written a book, and we have a few for sale, on uh, autism, outsmarting autism. And Patricia has been working in this field with children with disabilities for decades and is certainly one of the leaders and is a regular here in um, Chautauqua. And she tells us, I think accurately, that we have to look at total load. We can't look at one factor and say, oh, that's it. That's clearly the reason. We have to look at all of the factors that may be playing a role. And there are many potential factors. Um, but one thing that we really know is there aren't any genetic epidemics. To change the genes of a population takes very, very long periods of time. It doesn't happen in a few years or a few decades. But we do know that environmental factors can cause diseases and disorders very quickly. And there are many potential vectors for environmental harms to children. Air, water, food, pesticides, drugs, biologics. Those are some of the categories. There are many things that could cause this kind of widespread environmental harm. So I want to look at some of these. These are all things that Children's Health Defense looks at. And I'll come in the end, but we have a, a daily newsletter that keeps people abreast of these. We have a weekly kind of wrap-up for people as well. So air, we're very well aware that air has been the vector for problems in children's health in the past. So there was a major effort, effort decades ago to take lead out of gasoline. There was very widespread recognition, although it was fought tooth and nail by industry, there was widespread recognition that lead causes developmental harm. It causes lowering of the IQ. And after very significant efforts, lead was taken out of gasoline. And there's evidence to show that that's made major improvements in, in many different ways. Other toxic pollutants that go into the air include mercury from coal-fired power plants, among many other toxicants that go into the air from our 
factories. Um, mercury in particular, there's very good evidence from peer-reviewed science that shows the children that live closer to a coal-burning fire plant actually have higher rates of autism than children who live further away. I live now outside New York City. Forest fires have become a very big issue, right? So we just had days when literally they told people not to go outside, the sky was orange, and these forest fires had many toxic chemicals in them. Another dimension for air that is, we're really just coming to understand, in my view, is electromagnetic radiation and the effects of wireless technology. Again, this is billion dollar business. There are plenty of people who don't really want the population to be talking about this, but there's no question that electromagnetic radiation can cause, male, can, can affect male fertility, fertility, it may affect female fertility, it may have adverse effects on development of embryos, fetuses, and newborns. There's a strong link with certain types of brain cancer. Children's Health Defense litigated an issue against the Federal Communications Commission and won a case in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals in 2021 that the health regulations that the FCC put into effect in the 1990s were completely outdated, that they weren't dealing with the reality that we live in today where children have cell phones, they have tablets, they have laptops, they are surrounded, we have Wi-Fi, we have wireless, we have, um, what is it, casting on television. Children live in a completely different landscape of electromagnetic radi radiation than they did in the early 1990s. And we're still pushing the FCC to come out with these new health guidelines in conjunction with uh, the Food and Drug Administration, and, and they haven't yet done so. So pesticides is another concern, and children are just more vulnerable than adults, generally speaking. They're more um, biologically vulnerable than adults. So pesticides have now been in courts, not, you know, in, in the courts. Uh, judgments have gone up to the appeals court and not taken by the Supreme Court about the toxicity of, of glyphosate, which is in the very widespread use of the pesticide Roundup. So in litigation... Uh, a, bill, a $2 billion judgment was, was issued in a verdict by a jury in California against Monsanto, now owned by Bayer, um, for roundups uh, affecting this gentleman, Mr. Johnson, and causing his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That jury verdict was brought down to $289 million, but that gives you a sense of what the jury thought about the practices of Monsanto in hiding the information about the injuriousness of glyphosate. And glyphosate now, it's, it's used in almost all the corn in this country, almost all the soy in this country. It's, it's, it's incredibly widespread. Uh, glyphosate has, is, is virtually ubiquitous in, in many um, sort of processed foods in the United States. So food is another big concern. Um, we have genetically modified organisms. We don't have national labeling. Congress did not ever pass laws that force a company with genetically modified organisms to label it. So we have non-GMO labels, but we don't have GMO labels. We know that high fructose corn syrup that's used in candies and in sodas in particular, things for children, we know that that is linked to obesity. It goes right into the system. It, it's, it's faster acting than even table, than other kinds of sugars, and uh, it's a problem. Trans fats have been used pervasively in the fast food industry. That's also been clearly associated with health pro problems. And dyes, for some children with sensitivities, dyes can be very dramatic and children can suddenly have outbursts or other health concerns from things in the food supply. Water's another concern, and I was really pleased to see the plastic sculptures here on the grounds that really suggest a real sensitivity to the problems of plastics in the water, not just the pieces that fish and other animals can ingest, but the microplastics. What, what, is plastic, what are plastics doing? These are man-made. They're not a part of the natural environment. So toxicity in water can come from many different sources. Sewage is one. There's a lawsuit that we have been following, and I'm going to do an interview on, I think, next week, about fluoride in water. So the water supply in the United States is pervasively um, treated with fluoride, and there's very clear evidence that fluoride, that the, that the Environmental Protection Agency has not been honest about what they have known about the effects of fluoride on children's IQ. 
And so this lawsuit is, is in the Court of Appeals right now and is very important in my view, given how pervasive fluoride is. Another sort of developing issue are pharmaceuticals in the water, right? Not all the filtering systems in the water supplies that we have around the country are really filtering out all of the drugs that are used pervasively. And, and Americans are on lots of drugs. Over 60, it's 85% of Americans. Below that, children, it's 17%, I think, under age 10. It, it, and it goes up from there. So Americans are on prescription drugs on a daily basis, and it is getting in the water supply. But there are other issues, and, and we do talk about them at Children's Health Defense. So pills, a lot of children are on drugs. Um, and, and there are issues with the testing that's done and the recommendations of our regulators, of the, the FDA and the CDC and the NIH that does the research and, and commissions the research, and we can talk about that. So mercury and aluminum in particular are included in some vaccines. So there's much less mercury as a preservative than there once was in the early 2000s. Thimerosal, which contains ethyl mercury half by weight, was taken out of routine childhood vaccines, but it's still in the flu vaccine. In the sort of uh, once a year formulations, there is mercury in the form of thimerosal. Aluminum is in, almost, is in many, many, um, many, many vaccines and attenuated vaccines, uh, aluminum is present. And aluminum is not known to be biologically safe in, in any part of medicine. It, aluminum is a toxicant. So many biologics, vaccines are biologics because they have, uh, they, they, they affect the biology and they're tested in different ways than drugs. They're often cultivated in cell lines, either from animals or from aborted fetuses. Um, these are being used in vaccines, and, and again, the, the science on this is not as robust as one might imagine it is. And then bacteria and viruses. So there are live virus vaccines, there are bacterial vaccines, and these are given, again, pervasively, particularly to children, right? So the vaccine program in this country really started to ramp up in the 1960s, and I, for sure, out of good impulses of let's protect children for life, let's start at the very beginning, but interestingly, when the smallpox vaccine was being used in the 1700s and the 1800s, children were excluded in the early, in the 1700s, 1800s. It was for the adult population. They thought that children were too vulnerable to be getting it. So just a little sketch of the vaccine program. In the 50s, it was really just the polio vaccine and diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis. That was it, and smallpox was still being used in some places, not everywhere. Then there was a lot of research being done on vaccines, and there was uh, a vaccine against measles that was brought into widespread use, and then mumps, and then rubella. So by the end of the 1960s, we started to see um, you know, DTP, smallpox for some, <clears throat> polio, and measles, mumps, rubella. And then this, we got a combination shot, MMR, DTP. Still, we had the polio, oral, and then we got the um, intramuscular. Um, and so by the 70s, we really had um, a pretty robust program, but then it really, really changed in 1986. And most people don't really know this. In 1986, Congress passed the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act. And it was a law that was intended to create a compensation program for children who were injured. And they recognized that it was unavoid, that vaccines are unavoidably unsafe. In other words, for some children, there will be sensitivities. We can't screen them out. There will be injuries. These families should be compensated, is what Congress decided. But in compensation for that, they gave virtually complete liability protection to medical care practitioners administering vaccines and to the manufacturers of vaccines. And what this literally did create was a kind of gold rush. Lots of manufacturers then wanted to get into the vaccine game, and so we added things like the hepatitis B vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccine. And by the early 2000s, we have the annual flu vaccine. Now there's the recommendation of the annual COVID vaccine. There's the rotavirus vaccine. There's the Haemophilus influenza B vaccine. There's the pneumococcal vaccine. There's the human papillomavirus vaccine. There's the meningitis vaccine. And um, that's not even the complete list. So what we see is this dramatic, dramatic expansion of the childhood vaccine schedule. And what's so unique about vaccines 
is that they can be mandated, right? There's no other medicine that we, or food, or other product that we mandate for people. But we mandate vaccines for children to be able to go to school. And in most states, for instance, New York State, it's 40 odd vaccines that are mandated. Um, it's not the whole schedule, but it's about 40 odd vaccines in most states, including hepatitis B, including DP, D, DTaP, MMR, um, chicken pox, uh, all of these are mandated. And in some states, including New York, where we are, um, there is no religious exemption anymore. It was repealed in 2019. And medical exemptions are almost impossible to come by in the real world. Physicians realize that if they grant medical exemptions, they are basically potentially targeted by the medical boards for giving medical exemptions and sort of deviating from the, the orthodoxy. So we, we, um, this is certainly something that we have to look at. So you may imagine that vaccines, because they're so pervasive and because we hear all the time vaccines save lives, vaccines are safe and effective, you may imagine, and, and it's rational to imagine this, they must be incredibly well, they must be incredibly well researched. They must be well tested. It must be the case that this has been proven to be something that is beneficial to children. And the sad reality is, is that that is not the case. So this is a letter I'm showing you from 2020. This is a letter addressed to some of the attorneys in the space that I work in. This is addressed to an attorney with the Siri Glimstad firm. And they had asked a Freedom of Information Act request to the government, right? So you can ask the government for documents that they produce because we're taxpayers, right? And they asked for, from the Centers for Disease Control, all the documents in the Centers for Disease Control's possession which compare the health outcomes between children that have received vaccines and children that have never received any vaccines. And the Centers for Disease Control answered, a search of our records failed to reveal any documents pertaining to your request. The CDC has not conducted a study of health outcomes in vaccinated versus unvaccinated populations. Now, candidly, I don't believe that's true. <laughs> they have all the data. They have um, various databases that look at all kinds of children, and they can see children who are vaccinated according to the schedule and who are not. So I believe they have the evidence, but their answer, their formal answer is no, we don't do that study. I don't think most people care about a vaccine per se. People care about health. We all want children to be healthy. We all want to know that there's a healthy future generation. So this is a, a troubling answer from the Centers for Disease Control. We, we don't look at vaccinated versus unvaccinated. You probably also, again, rightfully imagine that vaccines are subject to typical scientific experiments. In a typical experiment, you must have a control. What's a control? It's an inert placebo. It is something that is not itself bioactive. It's a saline solution, typically, when you're dealing with animals or you're dealing with humans. Well, what we found through deep research on going through every single childhood vaccine that's been recommended by the Centers for Disease Control is that they were not tested against inert placebos. In some cases, they were not tested against anything. They simply gave the shots and then they said, oh well, it protects against something. Or more typically, the vaccines were tested against the older version of that vaccine. And over time, this has come to be more scrutinized. And so you'll see outside, I, I wrote a book about the human papillomavirus vaccine. This was a vaccine that was started to be used in the mid-2000s, 2009. So there was sensitivity that they wanted to test it against a, an inert placebo for Gardasil 9, which was the, second, was the second version. So they had a very small control group of about 300 young women who had not had the pre, they had not had, they didn't, they had a control, they had a saline solution, but those girls had received three doses of Gardasil before. So this is a way in which you have to, I, I believe that the system is being gamed, that there's not these, because if you use a true inert placebo, then you really do see what is the side effect profile, what's the cost benefit analysis. But if you have something that's very similar to the actual thing you're testing in terms of its toxicity, in terms of its ingredients, you're not going to see a dramatic difference between the two. 
So you may be thinking, well, how can this really be true? Why aren't we hearing about this? If this is as sort of serious as I'm saying, why aren't you hearing about it? And again, that's a very reasonable question. One issue is that this is very profitable, right? So the pharmaceutical industry in this country makes billions of dollars. Pfizer last year brought in more than $100 billion. So it's not only that we have a healthcare system that really does prioritize profits um, over people, they also have basically, they, the, the pharmaceutical industry since about the 1990s really controls mainstream media. So in the 1990s, under the Clinton administration, there was allowed by executive order direct to consumer advertising of prescription drugs. And that started a kind of gold rush of the pharmaceutical industry advertising drugs on TV. And that now includes childhood vaccines. So the HPV vaccine has been advertised on TV. The DTaP vaccine has been advertised on TV. And this, this advertising isn't necessarily even just to sell the product. It's to make sure that the industry can control the message. And you're not going to find on mainstream media stories that are truly critical of the pharmaceutical industry. And you're not even going to see it in public radio or public TV because, again, they're getting a lot of money from foundations that have a lot of money in the pharmaceutical industry, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So the other issue I mentioned to you in 1986, the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act passed Congress, so there's essentially no liability of the pharmaceutical industry or the health care practitioners. If a child is injured by a vaccine, the only remedy effectively is to go to a compensation program, the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, which has many problems. And then neglect, and people don't know, right? So this injury program isn't, isn't really advertised. The adverse event reporting system isn't really advertised. Um, you're not going to hear about it on the mainstream news, if you're looking on things like Substack, if you're looking at websites like Children's Health Defense or, or Informed Consent Action Network, you'll see this information, but you won't see it in the mainstream. So there, there have been a few movies, there, there have been efforts to get the word out, but it's um, money talks in the world that we live in. So there's very few market forces when you have mandates and you have no liability, you basically don't have market forces. You have to understand the attraction of a vaccine mandate in the childhood program. It's four million children in a year. It's a cohort that's billions of dollars. No liability. Um, and you know there is empirical evidence that since this 1986 and adding lots of vaccines to the schedule, they're not as safe as they were pre-86. And pre-86 led to the litigation and Congress needing to act. So um, one of the things that Children's Health Defense is very involved in is the censorship of information around medicine. We don't believe in censorship. We believe that the First Amendment in this country, free speech, is fundamental. In our view, you can't have a democracy unless you can have free speech. And so unfortunately, um, medical, the, the medical establishment in the United States has been all about misinformation. So at the governmental level and at the medical board level, and yet, this is Rochelle Walensky, who's recently stepped down as head of the CDC. She acknowledges we made some pretty dramatic, pretty public mistakes from testing to data to communications. They've made big mistakes and yet are still insisting on this idea that only orthodox speech is permissible. That's a contradiction in terms, in my view, and some of the mistakes they made were pretty remarkable, right? So the whole population globally was told if you take these shots, you're not going to get infected with COVID. You were told if you take these shots, you can't transmit the disease. You were told if you take these shots, you have to take the shots even if you had COVID because the shots will give you better immunity than natural immunity. None of those things have proven to be true. So the idea that it's a good idea to censor medical information, I think, is one that we have to be very skeptical about. I think one of the other troubling things um, that we've seen through the pandemic is that now for the first time, and this is since 2021, we're starting to see globally that life expectancies are dropping. So we had seen life expectancies being go, you know, going up pretty much continuously, a few little blips, but basically going up. And it's since 2021 that we've seen the life expectancy dropping. So in 2021, which was after the acute phase of COVID, we have seen with the, the vaccines, the, the Pfizer vaccine, then the Moderna vaccine, then the J&J &J vaccine in the United States all came into use starting at the very end of 2020. 
and then were in widespread use in 2021 and 2022. And we've seen very, very, it, granted this was used pervasively, very large, about a half the, little more than half the population took these shots in the United States, but we've seen lots of reports of adverse events, right? 1.5 million, and this was just through the end of 2022. Um, and just, we've never seen anything like it. Lots of different kinds of adverse events, hospitalizations, disabilities, heart problems, myocarditis, pericarditis, allergic reactions, deaths, Bell's palsy, shingles, anaphylaxis, miscarriages, these have all been reported. This is the official vaccine adverse event reporting system. It's got a lot of problems, I'm happy to talk about it, but these, these is what is, um, this has been what's been reported. So one of the books I have out um, on the table for sale, I think is a very important book. So we work with a publisher um, to publish books related to childhood health and, and these issues more generally. And this is a book called Cause Unknown, and it's about the epidemic of sudden deaths in 2021 and 2022 that are unexplained. And what we've seen in 2021 and 2022 are deaths that shouldn't have happened or, or that are very, we can't really explain them. So I'm gonna read, this is from the book. In 2021, the stats people expected went off the rails, right? We expected to see you know, deaths and injuries from COVID go way down and we expected to see no deaths. The CEO of One America Insurance Company publicly disclosed that during the third and fourth quarters of 2021, death in people of working age, 18 to 64, was 40% higher than it was before the pandemic. Significantly, the majority of the deaths were not attributed to COVID. So this is very troubling that young people as young as five have these unexplained deaths, sudden deaths of heart attack, stroke, and so on. And this has continued. And these are people in, you know, a 14-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 13-year-old, a healthy 46-year-old, often people who are engaged in very extreme exercise, very healthy people who've died suddenly. So we try to bring attention to a lot of these issues that we've just discussed. Um, we have a daily newsletter, it's called The Defender. We have um, television online, a streaming platform. We have over 20 hours of streaming um, a, a week. We're starting a bus that will start going around the country, listening to people's stories about what they're confronting in terms of these environmental health problems. Um, we publish books with Skyhorse Publishing. We bring people together. We have state chapters. We have a Washington, D.C. office that is working with legislators. We do litigation. We bring lawsuits against um, particularly state government agencies that we think are doing their job. We bring Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, we have people who are seeking public office today. Um, I do think that COVID did help many people become aware of this issue of coercive medicine and this issue of censorship of medical information in particular, but censorship in general. Um, one of the lawsuits that we're fighting, a couple of the lawsuits that we're fighting um, are against this kind of phalanx of big tech, the social media companies, Google, Facebook, um, um, I guess, what is it, Meta, Twitter, Previously, they were working really closely with the with the government, and there were we know of a hundred named people in the presidential administration who were acting to censor information, particularly about uh, health care. So, a book I'm really excited about that is not on the table, but it's coming out this month, is a book pulling together, collating the science on vaccinated versus unvaccinated outcomes. The thing that I showed you that the CDC says we don't have information. Well, a lot of studies have been done in the last several decades. Natural experiments where some children were vaccinated, others weren't. And studies where people enrolled children who were unvaccinated, particularly homeschooled children versus children who'd followed the schedule or something that's intermediate. I think this is a really important book. And Brian Hooker, who's the head of our science program, a, bio, um, a, a biologist said, the more vaccinated a child is, the more they have what's called innate immune suppression. So I think a really important book. A book that I did edit, and we have a few copies out there, is a book that I recommend. It was written in Hebrew, and I helped to edit the English language version, Turtles All the Way Down, Vaccine Science and Myth. So this is a deep dive on the pretty much the global childhood program. And one of the things I love about this book is it starts you from the beginning, and it says, you 
you may be aware that there's a controversy here. Let's just walk you through what the issues are. And it takes you through what, what are the clinical trials ahead of time, what is the adverse event reporting, what are the post-marketing surveillance studies, and it only uses government data and peer-reviewed science. There's nothing conjecturable. There's a thou over a thousand references. I think it's a very helpful book for somebody who's just trying to understand, like, what, do, what should I be thinking about this? What's the story? You know, doctors do take a Hippocratic oath to first do no harm, and doctors are obliged to provide patients with informed consent, prior free and informed consent. But I think when we really look deeply at this particular issue, we, we find deeply troubling um, issues that we really don't have informed consent. So Children's Health Defense is also looking at some of the issues um, moving forward, some of the, the future issues. So 5G is fifth generation telecommunications and we're hearing about downloading our programs more quickly, but the industry is looking at 6G and 7G and these are really big quantum leaps in terms of the level of exposure to electromagnetic radiation. So we have a very robust program looking at this issue of electromagnetic exposure. Um, we have a robot here on the bottom. We're all dealing with artificial intelligence. We're becoming more aware of the risks of artificial intelligence. There are many global leaders who really look towards a future of transhumanism, of really um, robots being quite integrated into the human population, AI, in every dimension of life. So we're looking at what that means. There's a lot of effort to move the food supply towards using insects. This is more pervasive than you may realize. If you look at some processed foods already today, you're gonna see crickets as one of the ingredients. So what is that about? Why are we moving towards you know, that? A thing that's happening very quickly, people are being debanked um, in the UK and the United States without prior notice, they're being told, your bank account is closed, you have to find someplace else. And this is moving towards what's called central bank digital currency. So this is being talked about. The US government has a program for CBDCs. This is a part of it. QR codes, this was starting to be used. Social credit scoring, um, it's being used certainly in China now. The World Economic Forum is a group that's articulating a lot of this future. Uh, Bill Gates has certainly been at the forefront of this in the United States. I think that if a foreign government had inflicted this level of an harm um, on our population, over 50% of children with serious conditions, we, we might be at war. I think there's a lot of damage, but we can't blame anybody but ourselves for this. And so I think, in my view, we do have to look at these questions. What is happening and how do we turn this around? Because I think um, we all want healthy children and healthy future generations. So thank you very much. I'm ready to take questions. Before we, um, before we go to questions, I want to say a big thank you to the Leaf and Sally Family Trust for providing revenue and funds for our cookies, <laughs> which are the most expensive things we ever have here, okay? Thank you very much to your family trust. We appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Allen will have books to sign and to talk to you after the event on the outside, and we're looking for questions. Yes, sir. I'll hold it. You talk. Uh, yes, thank you, ma'am. Um, I'm wondering if you have anything to contribute towards uh, something that I've been hearing about is high-frequency um, sonic testing. In other words, a sonogram of a pregnant woman, um, of the baby, with the impacts of the baby. You know, we haven't really done any real study on that, but it's certainly a question and an issue um, for sure. But I actually, I'm not knowledgeable on that. I have a question while we're waiting for another questioner. Um, I have a, a grandson which is about to um, apply to colleges. And many of the colleges require mandatory vaccinations up to the minute, while at the same time, the teachers are not. How do you, what do you think about that? I think it's bad. <laughs> so we have a lawsuit, I think I mentioned. Um, we brought a lawsuit against Rutgers University, which was the first university, and it's a major research university. It was doing clinical trials for all three COVID vaccine manufacturers, and they put in place in 2020 a mandate for students, but exempted all staff and exempted the faculty. So it would be hard to make an argument that that was 
it was hard to make an argument for it. And so we are, we lost at the trial court level. We are now on appeal. We had oral argument in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Our view is what is known today is these vaccines, there's no basis for a mandate. And a court in New York has actually held that at the trial court level. It doesn't stop infection and it doesn't stop transmission. It's very hard to see how there's a rational basis for a mandate. It's an individual health choice. As I think some people have said, there's a website that I recommend called nocollegemandates.org. And it's run by a woman named Lucia Sinatra. And that lists the colleges that have no mandates and the colleges that do. I, it's shocking to me that colleges are still mandating the COVID shots. Almost all colleges have some level of vaccine mandates. And there are, you know, there are religious and medical exemptions for most colleges. But what's fascinating to me is even the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services has dropped the COVID mandate for the healthcare workers nationally in this country. So it's very hard to see how the colleges can continue to do this. But we have to remember that colleges make a huge part of their tuition from the National Institutes of Health for their research budgets and from Health and Human Services. So I think that helps to explain a lot of where the mandates are coming from. I agree. Sir. Uh, you mentioned in a derogatory way fluoride. So why was it in the 50s that we were fluoridating water? Are we still fluoridating water? It was supposed to uh, get rid of cavities, but now you say they can call heart. I, I, I don't recall. So it's children. So the issue, this is not a case that Children's Health Defense is bringing, but we are um, working with lawyers who now have a case against the Environmental Protection Agency. There's very clear science that fluoride is harming young children in terms of intellectual development, and it appears as if that science has been censored effectively or has been downplayed, and it hasn't gotten to the public. But water is fluoridated still pervasively in this country. Is it? Not everywhere, not everybody, not, you know, if you have well water, you're not having fluoridated water, but in most public jurisdictions, there's still fluoridation of the water. It's interesting, and in, I'm no expert here, but in dental offices, they've really moved away from this considerably as well. Um, so, something yeah, to look at. They used to give you a fluoride treatment when, that, when they cleaned your teeth, then they would... And, and, and so when now... We were, yeah. When we were kids. Yeah, absolutely. That was a long time ago. <laughs> For many of us. <laughs> <laughs> Prehistoric. Okay. I'll hold it. You talk. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for coming. I th I'm a former hospital administrator and healthcare executive. Former. That's why I carry this case. <laughs> <laughs> and you, your speech resonated with me as a former administrator of the Children's Hospital in Chicago of Northwestern University. But be that as it may, I have a question which is, I learned during your talk is probably offbeat, so if you take the fifth, I'll understand. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to be sure I mentioned I really appreciated what you had to say. 99% of what you said resonated deeply with me. Um, I come, I retired to the great state of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an occasion which the state attorney general uh, received from Vanderbilt University without the prior consent of either the physician or the patient records of services rendered to, in this case, trans or LBGT patients and so forth. And despite my attempts to get any official answer from organizations, suffice to say that none of them responded uh, in any substantive way. Question. So the question is, do you have any opinion on that as yeah. your organization? Yeah. So Children's Health Defense has, thank you, and I think it's a very important area. I think the, this whole question of, it raises the issue of parental consent and coercion and what rights do children have outside of their parents. And it's a very fraught area. And we are exploring that area, and we have interviewed people on both sides of this issue, but we have not taken a position. I think it's a very, very troubling area that raises, as I say, very fundamental questions of parental rights and, and, and child welfare. And, I, and personally, this is my personal opinion, I think it's a complicated issue. I, I really think I, what, I, what you described of the hospital providing records to the attorney general without consent is abhorrent to me. That cannot stand. 
but the whole issue is a very fraught one. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm noticing that it's the fashion now for young women, girls, to wear their cell phones, you know, wear these uh, fanny packs across their chests. And I was just wondering um, if that's an issue. Um, you know, could so, so you know, if you read the fine print on your cell phone, it will say, do not put this up to your body. You know, do not put this up to your head. It'll say, put it six inches away. But people don't necessarily read the fine print. I happen to have a colleague, an attorney I work with, who held her phone like this reading late at night, and she developed a breast cancer exactly where the phone was beaming. You know, it's not causation, but um, we do know that people who have held their phones, so one of the lawsuits that we have been supporting is before, so similar to the 1986 National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act in into the 1990s, the telecom industry got a kind of a liability protection from Congress for cell phones and for cell towers. So we have a lawsuit on behalf of a gentleman who was using his cell phone before that law went into effect for his brain cancer, and he died. So it is a source of radiation. It's not really a shocker that radiation is going to have human effects. And I personally think we, we are very interested in following this. We have a part on our website, and we have a team that's doing litigation around this. They're putting, so for instance, one of the litigations we're involved is in Los Angeles, in a poor neighborhood, they have installed towers right, uh, they have an ordinance that would seem to permit them installing it right at the edge of your property, beaming right into a, a newborn's window. This is troubling. There's not science that will show that that is safe. So I think we really have, this is a kind of a brave new world, and we are very eager to explore that. We work with scientists in the area. We work with very, very knowledgeable litigators in this area who, you know, have been working in the telecom area for a long time. Uh, thank you, Mary, uh, for coming. Really enjoyed your talk, and, and glad you came to Chautauqua. Thank you. Um, you mentioned briefly in 2019 in New York State the religious uh, exemption uh, for childhood vaccinations in schools was repealed, and at the time it seemed like, well, there'll be lawsuits, and you know that should generate momentum. It seems like we just haven't heard much on that. I know there was a big victory in Mississippi at the federal level. Uh, could you tell us the state of those yeah, lawsuits? absolutely. Who's leading them, where yeah. they're at, and where they're going? Yeah, so we brought, I was deeply troubled by what happened in 2019, and we brought two law. well, before that, in 2018, you may remember that there were basically lockdowns in Brooklyn and in Rockland County around measles, and we brought a lawsuit and won on that in Rockland County. The repeal of the religious exemption, we brought a case on behalf of the 26,000 children that were immediately thrown out of school who had religious exemptions, who could not go to public school, and they couldn't go to private school either. Uh, and it was a weird repeal. It only car carried up to age 18, and there's still religious exemptions at the college level in New York State. So we um, lost on the basic question, but what won was a case on behalf, oh, anyway, we're still pursuing the religious exemption in New York. Another case that we lost that to me is deeply troubling is we brought a case on behalf of 12 children who had incredibly persuasive reasons to get medical exemptions. And those children, you know, a sibling had died of a vaccine injury or, you know, they had three different medical conditions and they can't get medical, and basically we, we didn't succeed in that case. So it's hard fought. The Mississippi judgment is very significant. It's still just at the trial court. The, interestingly, the Attorney General of Mississippi has not appealed that case. So that's gonna stay likely as, an, a, as a, a trial court decision, but, in some of the litigation we've been doing in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals that covers New York State, they have recognized that what they did regarding the religious exemptions of New York City employees was unconstitutional, suggesting that if you're a Catholic, you must follow the Pope, or saying if you, um, you know, are if your your religious belief is 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 inadequate somehow. And so some of that, those decisions from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, we believe may, we may be able to use those to reinstate the religious exemption. 
Also, there are legislators in the Assembly and in the Senate in New York who are trying um, to reinstate a religious exemption. I'm not sure there's votes there yet, but I definitely think it's something that we should all be advocating for. I mean, every state should have the possibility of a religious exemption in today's world. Given, right, one of the success stories is that there, arguably, there isn't a COVID mandate in any public school jurisdiction in the country at this point. Not one, not DC, not New York, not California, sort of the places you'd expect. But I think it's critical that before that starts to potentially come down the pike, it, there have to be ways that families can exempt their children who don't believe in this and who, for whom it violates their core beliefs. Thank you. What's your position on chemically and surgically changing a child's identity? Yeah, we have not taken a position on that issue, as I, as I said to the gentleman before. I think it's a very fraught issue, um, and we have not taken a position on it at this point. Okay. Question? Thank you again, Mary, for being here today. Um, in the aftermath of COVID with um, EUAs, lockdowns, potential problems with the vaccines, do you see any changes coming overall in medical freedom and health and options for families and parents? Options for? Families and parents. For families and parents. <laughs> well, I think now I would, I would go out a little bit on a limb and say that I think that lockdowns have shown themselves to be unbelievably deleterious and did almost nothing to stop the spread of disease, right? So I think it's, you know, 16 million family businesses were closed down, children's educational level plummeted during the lockdowns for children with disabilities and developmental delays. It was absolutely a nightmare. And there's very little evidence that it did any good in the school. So I don't think anybody is going to be closing down schools anytime soon again. I don't. I could be wrong. <laughs> but I, I, I don't think that would work very well um, at, a, at a government policy level. I do think that, um, and I do think that, that COVID has, has uh, you know, made more people aware of the hazards of coercive medicine and censorship and propaganda around medicine. I wish I could say that there's been a total breakthrough. I think there's now a bit more of a conversation about this, but I'm sad to see that the medical boards are still literally persecuting persecuting the doctors who stood up during COVID and said, these treatments that you're telling us, remdesivir and ventilators, they don't work. And here are these treatments that do work. And these doctors are having their license suspended. They've lost their licenses. They've been kicked out of their various societies. That's deeply troubling. Again, we're working on that issue. We're representing these doctors. We're in touch with them. We can't have censorship in medicine. It is just not right. And we're working on the exemption issues, medical and religious exemptions. I think that's not, in my view, no medicine should be mandated. I, I just think that's not, according to the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. The, and patient autonomy. For decades, we've been talking about autonomy of the patients and doctors respecting that. And then we move into this era of everybody has to be vaccinated with an experimental emergency use authorization product. So it's a kind of schizophrenia, but I don't think it's over. I think that people in some ways are so relieved that you know the pandemic is over. There's a certain quietness, but the good part about that in the legal system is now there's a bit more calm, there's less panic, there's less sort of frenzy. And so I am starting to see courts look at this in a much more sober-minded way and in a much deeper way than they did over the last three years. One final question. Mary, you've scared us to death. <laughs> and maybe we, you can leave us on a positive note of some ways we can protect ourselves from all these things in our air and our food and our water. Well, thank you, Patty. No, I, I don't mean to scare you to death. And, and, and Patty, just for you as a knitter, I included the question mark with the knitting ball. So, no, my intent is not to scare anybody to death. My, my intent is knowledge is power. I mean, I start from the premise that knowledge is power and that candidly, uh, nobody is going to protect us and our children better than us. That's my premise. I don't believe the state government, the federal government, the World Health Organization cares more about me and my children than I do. So from my perspective, knowledge is power. 
And we have to, and, and it's hard to discriminate against knowledge, right? And it's very hard when the FDA and the CDC and the NIH and the WHO all say one thing. It's very hard for people to imagine that somebody saying something different could be correct. But that's why I think it's so important that we exercise our critical thinking skills and do your own homework. And I wish I could say, Patty, it didn't take a lot of work to, to, to figure this stuff out. It takes time. You, you, you do have to, you know, it takes time. But I think what we're talking about, is, as we looked at, we're talking about, you know, health is wealth. There's nothing more important to any of us than our own health and our children's health. And so it's worth the investment of time to, to learn. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Holland.